Oh, uh, yes. Mm. Anyway, I think we should throw, uh, throw open yeah, to, our, right. to our friends and mm -hmm. uh, to uh, you know, your questions. You bring questions <coughs> and thoughts and comments this evening. So let's hear from you a little bit and we can widen the conversation. There's one person with a microphone. Is there another person Is as well? Hello? Hello? Oh, yeah. Okay. okay, great. Well, first of all, thank you very much. You've been incredibly inspiring. And I do, you kind of hinted at it there. I do wonder if you, you know, you today, um, Sister Ilya, you started off with that image of, uh, I think it was from Charlottesville, I imagine, the, the fighters, you know, the maybe it was different races fighting each other. And I guess I wonder if you have ah. any comment to make on what feels like a rise in hate, a rise in fascism, yeah. a rise in you mean power that, over, like I feel like we're going backwards and maybe I'm hoping that it's the last gasp of the old white guard, um, you know, as they die, as you know, just the old, really old <laughs> white control power, you know, as it's going down, it's grabbing for power one last time, that's what yeah. I'm praying for. But I would love your thoughts on this in yeah. our bigger picture and how we can get through it. And so that picture is from Charlottesville from last so, year, that's right. you know, when they had that um, white supremacy thing. Uh, I think what's happening, if I could put this in a shorthand, is I think, uh, I think patriarchy is uh, dying a very slow death, and it's, it's killing itself to remain alive. And here when I say patriarchy, I, I think it goes with that, with uh, the sense of white supremacy, with the sense of ontological superiority, uh, that you know there are races that are higher than others. But what's happening, I think, is we are actually seeing the forces of evolution at work. We're in a world that is shrinking globally. In other words, we're converging. That's what con evolution is, convergence. Uh, and as we converge, uh, we have a shift in consciousness, and that's what we're seeing. And I think what's happening is there is a resistance to that force of convergence, uh, because there's a tremendous fear of what convergence will mean for us. When we converge, we will not be, in a sense, what we were yesterday. We will be a new type of configuration, uh, both personally and collectively. And I think what we're seeing is the deep, deep fear of uh, a new configuration that will emerge. So here's what I see, whether it's the immigration um, problem right now, which is not a problem from my perspective, but it's a problem for some people in, in, you know, in the United States, um, or with the, uh, the, the white supremacist uh, type of resurgence, which I find abominable. Uh, given the fact that, you know, Martin Luther King, whose feast we just celebrated, and, you know, how many years now after the civil rights movement, and we're back to this. And there's one thing, there's a lesson here of evolution, that we don't fall into naivete about it. It does not proceed linearly. It's not like, oh, everything's just going to get better, you know, as we go along. Evolution is always marked by sideway resistances, by backward trends, um, by uh, a lot of death, a lot of conflict. Um, and what we know is that despite all these factors of conflict, resistance, death, sideway resistance, there's a force of convergence that keeps plodding on. And, and that's our choice today. Uh, and we, what happens is the news, I think, tends, it's very sensational, right? It tends to the side of what's dying and what's resisting and what's conflicting, and it does not tend to what's converging, what is globalizing, what is rising in terms of consciousness. That's the choice I think we, ha that's one of the shifts we have to make, uh, to, to tend to the sides of what is taking place that's actually becoming more unified, more conscious. So we will continue to see these forces of resistance, undoubtedly. Um, it's not, you know, what we're moving toward is not going to be an overnight, overnight sensation like, oh, let's by next week should all arrive at the new, you know, second axial period type thing. Um, we're in a huge paradigm shift. We are, we are evolution now on a level of self-conscious, consciousness, and it does matter that we, we grasp the evolution part, in other words, the movement the complexity, the dynamism as part and parcel of our lives so that we don't fall into this trap of the sensationalism and the downward spiral of, um, 
uh, racial, racial profiling, of uh, ontological superiority. You know, we build a hierarchy of who's better and you know, who's worse. So stick with the program. Yeah. You'll be up there. I, uh, <laughs> I like very much that, that perspective. And I'd like to offer another as well that I think complements it. And that is, first of all, of course, what's going on, the rise of fascism, uh, is, uh, is not just an American situation. They just elected a, a fascist in Brazil. Mm -hmm. And of course, Hungary and Poland have gone down some rabbit holes in the last year or two that are very serious and discouraging. So um, one way I see all this is in terms of our three brains that our reptilian brain, which is 420 million years old and all of us, is, wants to dominate. <clears throat> and the reptilian brain is about win-lose, and I think it has a special link to testosterone. I think uh, men especially fall into uh, the reptilian brain syndrome, win-lose. I win, you lose. And so it, it's kind of baked into patriarchy. But then the mammal brain, which is half as old, 210 million years old, this is the brain of compassion and kinship. And this is why the words for compassion in both Hebrew and Arabic come from the word for womb. So the womb people, the, the mammals, we're here to, to uh, develop our powers of compassion. But the problem is that if the reptilian brain is dominating, uh, compassion gets trivialized and even misunderstood. And, uh, and then, of course, our third and most recent brain is, of course, that powerful one that has taken over the planet in 150,000 years like no other, no other species ever came close to doing. So as Thomas Aquinas says, one human being can do more evil than all the other species put together. Wow, when I first read that, I felt so proud. We're good at something, you know. <laughs> but, but how did he know that? seven centuries ago, before Hitler, before Pol Pot, before Stalin, because unlike modern culture and education and religion, he um, appreciated our powers of creativity. That he, the, the, a pre-modern consciousness recognizes that creativity is immensely powerful and the intellect is immensely powerful, but it needs steering. So we come to the first point. What can we do about this reptilian brain? Uh, because, you know, the, the, the fascism is about control. It's about control. And it's certainly about control of the feminine. And uh, because the feminine represents creativity. I had a, a dialogue with one of the founders of Chaos Theory, a mathematician, Richard Santa Cruz, uh, who wrote this brilliant book, Eros, Gaia, and Chaos. And, um, uh, and uh, he talked about the, um, you know, about chaos and chaos theory in science. And then I talked about chaos in the person, the via, what the mystics call the via negativa, when everything falls apart. And like I said the other day, we're in a collective dark night of our species today. And that's chaos, because we don't know what's, what's next, how to pull out of it. But, and then afterwards, a woman came up uh, and she said, I'm a midwife. I didn't want to speak, she said, because I'm shy. But she said, I'm a midwife. And nothing is more chaotic than birth. It's a mess. And there's blood all over the walls. But from it comes a newborn being. And this just hit me so hard. This is why during the goddess times, chaos was honored as a goddess. It's when patriarchy took over that the myths shifted, the stories shifted. And then Marduk had to kill Tiamat. The male had to kill the feminine. And then religion felt, oh, this is our job. Uh, to keep order, because this chaos thing, which always comes with creativity, can turn the apple cart over. And then he explains this, this scientist, I forget his name, Ralph Abrams. He said, in, in the 18th century, science said, go aside religion, we will do it, we'll keep order. And so science became the bearers of orthodoxy until the 1960s when the chaos theory came to be. And, and then science kind of woke up and said, oh, oh, that's interesting. Chaos is part of nature and is very much part of creativity. Ask any artist. So my point is that um, that's the way that I see all this. And so how do we calm that reptilian brain? Meditation calms the reptilian brain. How do I know that? Because reptiles aren't real good at bonding, but they're great at lying in the sun. They're, they're, they love solitude. They're like you. 
They love solitude. So they're monks. They're monks. Reptiles are. Because monos, the monk, means solitude. One who, who's happy being alone. So check it out with your friendly alligator or snake or what have you. They love to be alone in the sun, of course. So, um, so here's how you, you tame your reptile brain. You meditate. Because meditation is about learning to be at home with solitude. Without a lot of thoughts, without busyness, without muzak, without jobs to do. So in meditating, you're calming the reptilian brain in you. Nice crocodile, nice crocodile. <laughs> when we do that, when we befriend the reptilian brain, then the mammal brain can finally begin to assert itself with its powers of compassion. And as I said earlier, not only Buddhism, not only Christianity, but Judaism, Islam, all the religions of the world have been trying to teach us the truth of of compassion, our capacity for compassion, which is a godlike compa uh, capacity. But for this to happen, let's get practical. We have to start finding, you know, there are so many wonderful avenues to meditation on the planet today. Never have we had such a smorgasbord available. So you find what's good for you. But like, things are so bad in the public schools in San Francisco these days that they've introduced yoga in the public schools. And um, one little fourth grader, they interviewed him, and he sa they asked him, what does yoga do to you, for you? And he said, well, I come to school grumpy, and yoga makes me ungrumpy. <laughs> well, I think it's a pretty good start, you know? <laughs> so, and we have to understand, also, art is meant to be ed meditation. The art process is not about producing a capitalist product to take home to your grandmother or sell on the street. That's a side thing. The most important thing of art is, is bringing uh, your centering process together. It is a meditation. It's often more fun than sitting on a cushion for hours at a time. So we shouldn't leave out this great accomplishment, especially Western culture, of art as meditation. Making music, listening to music, dancing, etc. cetera. Uh, writing, I mean, all our things, you know, we can turn all of it into meditation and have that ecstatic experience you yes. had mm -hmm. in a scientific laboratory. Right. This is how we, we tame that reptilian brain and get on to other things. Yeah, great. Yeah.